Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Many of you following a gluten-free diet are making one of the biggest faux pas and it's probably keeping you from achieving the health goals that you're after. And that faux pas is continuance of rice-based foods. We're gonna talk about the problems associated with rice toxicity, why people with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease shouldn't be touching the stuff and if you are, pay close attention. We're going to talk about why it's toxic. We're going to be talking about what you can do if you have been eating it and how you can make a better recovery. So, as usual with the show, if you've got questions, you know, especially on topic questions, I'm going to answer those first. So, go ahead and start piping those into the feed, and I'll do my best to get through them all before we wrap the show up tonight. So, let's dive into the toxicity of rice. So, I think it's first important to discuss what many people don't understand very well, which is rice itself is a, has a form of gluten in it. This chart or this diagram that you're looking at here lists out the different grains okay, and the different types of gluten found in the grain. And you can see rice contains a type of gluten called orzenin. And by concentration, it is the lowest percentage of, of gluten found in grains. You can see some of these others are much higher. The wheat at 69, corn at, at, uh, at 55. You can see oats at you know, between 12 and 16, etc. But rice lower than them all at around 5% total um, gluten you know, for the protein content. And so rice is typically ignored and a lot of people think, oh, I can eat rice and I do just fine. And, and, and again, there are more than one reason. One of the reasons why I, I would say avoid rice is because of the fact that it has gluten. And remember, we talked about this just a few weeks ago. Gluten causes damage at 20 parts per million. That's the size of a breadcrumb, and that damage can last for up to two months. And again, this is one of the reasons why so many people going on that traditional gluten-free diet, right? They go get their diagnosis, their GI doctor says you need to be gluten-free, so go learn about it on the internet. They go learn on it about the internet, and everybody says rice is gluten-free. Everybody talks about how gluten-free rice is, and the problem is, is rice is not gluten-free. Rice is gliadin-free, and most people when they're talking about gluten are referring to the wheat gluten gliadin, but rice definitely has a form of gluten in it. Now, aside from that, now that we know that rice technically is not gluten-free, let's talk about some of these other things that, that you need to be aware of. So, when people go gluten-free, okay, one of the things that happens is right here, this number two is processed food becomes the go-to. They're, they're jumping at anything they can find that has a gluten-free food label on it in the grocery store. And most of the time, you know, these processed, quote-unquote, gluten-free foods, because they're technically not gluten-free, but they contribute to malnutrition and diabetes. And the problem with that is when you're learning about gluten and you're trying to change your diet, you're trying to do so to improve your health. You're already in a state of malnutrition. This is already your problem. And so when you gravitate to all that processed rice-based food, you're just adding to the issue of malnutrition. So you're just adding flames or adding fuel to the flames, so to speak. Um, re remember this, so coming down here from two to four, as much as, and this is research back, so as much as 92% of those following a gluten-free diet continue to have health problems that are persistent. Now, we'll go even beyond that. Some people feel better, even though they're eating rice, they're not eating wheat, barley, and rye, but when they get a biopsy, so when their doctor, when they get that celiac diagnosis and they do a follow-up biopsy, as much as 92% of the time, these people have persistent atrophy, persistent damage to the intestinal villi. This is in some cases 18 months after they've been on this diet, in other cases up to five years after being on the diet. So it's important to understand one of the reasons why that happens is what you're choosing and what you're, what you're buying and what you're choosing to call gluten-free. There's no such thing as gluten-free rice. Technically, it's not gluten-free. It plays a major contributing factor in this number right here, this vast 
majority of people going gluten-free continue to have issues. But one of the other things that we see is right here in this number six is that processed food, there are a number of different studies that have been done on this. And, and I think the, the, the one I've read that was the highest was that of packages that were pulled off the grocery store shelf. These were packages that were labeled gluten-free and as high, the highest, is up to 41% of these packages were cross-contaminated with enough wheat and barley and rye to create a reaction. And so again, a lot of these food products, so like these processed foods, are rice-based products. So I know some of your, maybe your minds are being blown right now. You, you probably wanna hit me. You probably wanna scream at me. Uh, because I'm, I'm just here maybe taking away one more food. It, you don't shoot the messenger. I'm not taking away anything from you. I'm trying to educate you. Again, rice contains a form of gluten called orzenin. People going on a gluten-free diet traditionally, 92% of them fail to recover and have persistent atrophy. And up to 41% of foods that are labeled gluten-free, many of which contain rice, are cross-contaminated with enough wheat, barley, or rye to create damage. Remember, how much does it take to create damage. Look at that. Gluten can cause damage in doses as low as 20 parts per million. That's the size of a breadcrumb. So it doesn't take much. And again, if you go back and watch what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which was how long does it take gluten to get out of your system when you gluten yourself, you're looking at two months, potentially two months of inflammation. So if you are the rice junkie, buying the rice noodles, the rice pasta, the rice breads, the rice cereals, you want to check yourself, especially if you're still struggling to try to recover. Okay, I want to share with you some of my experience. I've been, I've been seeing patients now for 21 years clinically, and this is what I see. These are the top symptoms that I see when people have gone, we call it, we have a name for it, when they go gluten-free, the right way, we call that true gluten-free, the true gluten-free diet. Because what this really means is they're avoiding corn and rice and sorghum and some of the other things that are oftentimes labeled gluten-free. But most people, when they start, they don't know this information and they, they follow what we would call a traditional gluten-free diet. Traditional gluten-free diet is what you learn on the web. It's what you learn about from most major websites as far as the traditional definition of gluten. Most of these sites are, are citing information as old as 19, early 1950s. They're, they're pulling the science from that time frame and applying it into today's knowledge base and it's wrong. It's not accurate. And so it's why we have the differentiate, differentiation between true gluten-free diet and the traditional gluten-free diet. But in my 21 years of experience, this is what I have seen in terms of rice exposure. Persistent muscle and joint pain, muscle cramping, nerve pain, migraines, brain fog, skin rashes, stomach pain, diarrhea, constipation, blood in the stool, and intermittent low-grade fevers. And sometimes, when I share a story with you, a little anecdote. Um, it's a little girl, a little infant baby. Her mom, um, her mom was, was just terrified because this little girl had gone gluten-free. They had taken her traditionally gluten-free, right? Wheat, barley, rye-free. But they were giving this little girl a meal replacement powder because she was a really picky eater. And the meal replacement powder had rice in it. It was one of the top ingredients. And she brought it into me because she wanted to know should, you know, should she keep giving this food to her child? Um, and it was the first thing I looked at. It was the first ingredient I saw. My eyes just drew right to it. And I was like, this little girl needs to get off this product. And what was happening to this little girl? She would spike fevers, 103, 104 degrees. They were taking her in and out of the ERs because her fever kept spiking. And the doctors kept thinking she had an infection. They didn't know what to do with her. They were pumping her full of antibiotics. I mean, we're talking about five, six trips to the ER you know, over a year's period of time before this little girl was brought into my office. Well, she was following, again, a traditional gluten-free diet. She was avoiding the wheat, the barley, the rye, those things, but she was eating every day. One of her major staple foods was a protein powder that contained rice. And the second we took that out of her diet, she never went back to the ER. She never had a mysterious fever again. So I share that with you because this is actually, I've seen this a number of times, especially in children. 
And, and so you just want to be aware it's a symptom that can persist despite going on a gluten-free diet if you're not keeping tabs on the rice. So rice, very, very important to get that out of your gluten-free diet. Now I want to talk a little bit about something called FPIES, F-P-I-E-S, because when we, when we think about the gluten-free diet, most people think about this term, celiac. There's another term you got to be aware of, FPIES. What does that stand for? Food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. So this is a, a problem that occurs in, and it's most commonly in infants and it occurs as a result of a similar type of reaction. It's not the classic allergy response. You know, when you take your, you, you take your um, loved one or you take a child to the allergist and they do the skin prick tests and they're looking for allergic reactions, well, those allergic reactions are mediated by something called IgE. It's a type of antibody that we produce in response to a food or a protein that that we might get something like our lips swell or our throat constricts or we might break out in hives. That's called an acute allergy. FPIES is not IgE related. FPIES looks a lot like celiac reaction, meaning it's a completely different type of immune system response. And the number one food that triggers this, and this can be, this can be identical to celiac disease, which is why I bring it up, you see these symptoms here. These are all symptoms of food protein induced enterocolitis. Vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, failure to thrive. This is true of infants and children. Lethargy and poor energy. So these are, are symptoms, generally speaking, not only to, can it happen to children, it can happen to older folks as well, but it's very common to catch it earlier in childhood. And again, it matches celiac. And a lot of times what happens is, is a child will get a diagnosis of celiac, but they won't dig deeper. The doctors won't dig any deeper. The number one cause of food protein induced enterocolitis is rice. And this has been studied several times, and this is actually one of the reasons why we see children have both. They have both food protein induced enterocolitis and they also have celiac disease, so they have both problems going on simultaneously. Remember, there's this old saying in medicine, and that is everybody's entitled to more than one problem, and sometimes you can have both. Sometimes you can have one and or the other. But rice was the number one trigger. And, and a lot of foods, a lot of not what we would call non-allergenic foods, what do they want to use? They want to use rice. Well, this is allergy. Remember I said earlier this IgE is allergy, but this is different than allergy, right? So although rice may be low allergenic in terms of stimulating an IgE response, it is highest on the list of generating, generating another type of immune response that looks exactly like celiac disease and can create the symptoms that match celiac disease. Again, that's called food protein induced enterocolitis. You should be aware of it because it's very, very common. I see this on a, on a relatively frequent basis and it's just one of those other issues where rice is a problem. Now let's talk a little bit more about cross-contamination. Uh, I mentioned earlier a little bit about it, but I want to share a quote with you from this recent uh, food safety review. This was a major review published in the journal Nutrients here just several months ago. You can see here, again, new science, right? Not using antiquated science, but due to gluten contamination, many inherently gluten-free products derived from corn, rice, millet, etc., cannot be consumed by patients with celiac disease these products, if misbranded as gluten-free and used by the patients with celiac disease, could result in a recurrence of symptoms. Contamination of gluten-free foods with gluten-containing material can occur at many stages of food production, from the fields, to the farms, to the mills, to the factories, as well as handcraft enterprises, restaurants, and households. So again, a lot of these products that are being used we know cross-contamination is a major issue. So even if you just completely ignored everything I just said about rice gluten and the fact that rice does contain a form of gluten and that that gluten can induce an enterocolitis syndrome, if you ignored everything I just said, you should be hearing me right here, is that these foods, corn, rice, millet, etc., 
are cross-contaminated to such a great degree that celiac patients and gluten-sensitive individuals are not recovering. Now, from this review, these two statistics come from. Okay, so one of the studies reviewed in this major review showed that up to 32% of the time, restaurant foods labeled gluten-free tested positive for gluten. Meaning these foods were taken, they were tested for gluten, even though they were called gluten-free, they tested positive for gluten. We also have this, 20% of packaged products labeled gluten-free in one of these major studies tested positive for gluten. Now those are huge odds. That means if you are relying on eating out at restaurants, if you are relying on packaged processed foods as staples in your diet, you're playing Russian roulette with your recovery. And so I don't, I don't encourage that. And again, what did I say earlier? Up to 92% of gluten sensitive individuals that go on the diet fail to achieve a remission or recovery of the intestinal damage. And what does that do? If, you're, if your guts, if your intestines don't heal, what that does is that sets you up for malnutrition. And the problem with malnutrition so is vitamin and mineral deficiencies, right? You need vitamins and minerals to heal and repair, right? So if you have malnutrition and you propagate that very same malnutrition by eating poorly, you never give your body the tools that it needs to heal and repair the damage, the, the years, depending on, on the case and when you were diagnosed, but the years of gluten-induced damage. And this can take, remember, to heal from a gluten-related issue can take 18 months and up to three years. So if you're doing this, right, you're sabotaging yourself, you're just fast forwarding the nutritional mal, you know malnutrition nutritional deficiency issue and you're sabotaging your ability ever to recover let's look at some of the common foods that are rice based that were found to be cross contaminated with wheat barley and rye okay so a lot of your breakfast cereals as a matter of fact here um, very recently there have been a number of cereal recalls. Um, General Mills has had cereal recalls. Some of the gluten-free cereal brands have had a number of recalls. Why? Because somebody goofed, right? They put the wrong stuff in the product. It was cross-contaminated. A lot of your breads, a lot of your pastas, and a lot of these pastas, by the way, are garbage anyway. They're, they're, they're one of the other problems is, is almost none of this stuff, right? Your baby food, your meal replacement bars, most of this stuff is not even organic. And so part of the problem, it's not organic, then you get pesticide exposure. And big, one of the big issues, you know, going on a gluten-free diet with pesticides is you're trying to recover your microbiome. That, that is, you're trying to recover the good, healthy bacteria that populate your GI tract, that help you digest your food, that help make B vitamins, that help your immune system calm down. And if you're eating a bunch of non-organic rice-based foods, what you're really doing is blowing out your gut with tons of pesticides and you're disrupting your microbiome's ability to ever make a recovery. There've also been a number of recalls on baby food for other reasons, even beyond the, the gluten contamination. Um, but we get recalls very frequently here for heavy metal, for toxic metals. How many of you, you know, as parents wanna give your child extra cadmium or extra mercury or extra lead. Hopefully nobody's hands go up there, right? So these baby food, um, you have to understand, most of these baby food manufacturers don't care about your kid. They're making a, a very cheap, very junky, very malnourishing product at very low cost and they're selling it back to you at an extreme markup. You know, most cases of, of formula and baby food are extremely expensive, even though the ingredients that goes into them are extremely toxic and extremely cheap to produce. And so um, it's very important if you're buying, if you, your parent, you're buying things like baby food or, or, or formula, because you, for whatever reason, you might not be able to breastfeed, you need to read the ingredients because the vast majority of the ingredients in those products is sugar and rice. Now, as I said earlier, other problems with rice, we said heavy metal toxicity. So rice has been shown, been a number of studies that have proven this, to be contaminated with arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead, right? And so if we're talking about infant cereals, if we're talking about infant food, right, what do these things do? They 
damage the skeletal structure, the, they damage the brain, they're, they're, um, they're very toxic in that regard. And so they can create lower IQ, lower intelligence in your children, among other health issues. So these heavy metals are a major, major problem in brands of rice. And, and some people say, well, Doc Osborne, what about brown rice? Brown rice is even worse because a lot of the heavy metals, where do they accumulate? Well, they accumulate in the bran. And so if you've got, if you've, if you're taking that whole rice, right, the brown rice where you don't crack off that outer hull, you're getting most of the metals in that. It's actually polished rice actually has less metal than brown rice does. But the problem with the polished rice may have less metal, but it has also less vitamins and minerals, right? So it has less nutrition. So then what you get is you get this food that's super high in simple carbohydrates, right? So that what, you know, what is that? It's basically it's sugar. So now You've, whether you did brown rice, you got heavy metal. You go with white rice, it still has heavy metal, but you get less of it. But now you get this, right? You get all that sugar with low in nutrition density. And so then that, what does that do? There are a number of research studies showing that high, consumers of high levels of rice have a higher risk of development of type 2 diabetes. And some people come to me and say, well, what about China? What about India? Go look at them. They're overweight. They're obese. They have massive heart disease. They have massive stroke issues. And they have massive, massive levels of diabetics in those countries. Um, don't be fooled by the rhetoric that you might see on TV or that you might see in the commercials. Those countries struggle greatly with problems associated with using rice as a primary staple food in their diets. And, uh, and so this last slide I've got for you is just something to be said. This was recently uh, published in the journal Epidemiology. It talks about the unintended consequences of a gluten-free diet. Now, I would argue that when you're eating rice, you're not really on a gluten-free diet. But, you know, again, the traditional gluten-free diet, the unintended consequences. Commercial gluten-free products primarily contain rice flour as a substitute. Emerging evidence suggests rice-based products can contain high levels of toxic metals, Rice is a recognized source of arsenic and methyl mercury exposure. Again, the unintended consequences of people going gluten-free because they think it's a healthier diet. And so now what they're really doing is they're eating a bunch of rice-based processed junk foods full of pesticides and heavy metals. And so the unintended consequences there is they're basically they're damaging their health in an attempt to try to achieve greater levels of health. So remember, just because something is labeled gluten-free doesn't necessarily give it this kind of automatic stamp of being a healthy product. And rice is definitely one of those. Not, not only is it not gluten-free because of the orzenin that it contains, but you know, again, the other problems associated with it, um, as we've discussed tonight, are a big, big issue and a big, real um, problem as to why many people trying to go on a gluten-free diet never truly really recover and continue to have years and years of persistent problems, inflammation, and uh, progression of disease. So that being said, let's dive into your questions. But before we do that, I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. Did you know that research shows that heavy grain and gluten consumption can contribute to high tissue levels of heavy metals like mercury, arsenic, lead, and cadmium? That's why I designed Ultra Metal Detox. Ultra Metal Detox is a premium gluten-free formula containing ingredients to help the body eliminate toxic oxidative metals. It contains a unique blend of nutrients that support mineral balance, antioxidant function, and detoxification. What makes this formulation so unique? Ultra Metal Detox contains Himalayan Shilaji. It's an extract. This key ingredient is a fulvic acid mineral, rich resin known for its strength and energy promoting properties. It also contains a rich amount of essential minerals to support overall balance while detoxifying. This formula also contains EDTA, an amino acid compound used to support detoxification of metals largely in the gastrointestinal tract. It contains the plant power of chlorella, a naturally occurring microalgae and excellent source of chlorophyll believed to bind toxic metals. Additional ingredients include NAC, lipoic acid, and allicin. This trio of natural compounds is rich in antioxidants known to help protect the body from the oxidizing effects of toxic heavy metals. Now as a suggested use for daily maintenance, take two capsules daily with food. 
for enhanced performance, two capsules twice a day in divided doses with food. And for intense detoxification, take up to six capsules a day in divided doses with food. It's important to work with your healthcare provider to monitor you should you embark on an intense detox protocol. So keep that in mind before trying that higher dose. All right, so let's dive into some of the questions that, uh, that people are writing in with. So Kim wants to know, she says, I have a three and a half year old grandson. He's been gluten free now for five months. He's still experiencing GI issues and not gaining weight. What would you suggest for next steps? I would suggest asking, you know, or looking at his gluten-free diet. What kind of gluten-free diet is he following? Most people follow that wheat, barley, and rye-free diet, but they continue with things like oats, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, teff, and other grains. Um, and they, they don't really dive into the true gluten-free diet. And that's where you have to go first. Now, you might also look at with, with youngsters like that, dairy is oftentimes a problem of persistence as well because of the cross-reactivity that can occur with dairy and gluten. So again, I would look at those two areas first. And then if he continues to struggle, don't wait. Get the, get the child in and, and get the child in to see somebody who's qualified in nutrition, somebody you know, with similar credentials as myself who can, can really, really help um, help you navigate that diet through the right testing. Because really, a lot of times, it's testing that helps give us the answer that we're missing with, um, with elimination diets and guesswork. Uh, let's see here. Shanquilla says, what are reasons other than actually eating um, gluten products? Also, if endoscopy came out normal, is it safe to think gluten-free lifestyle is working or can you still be exposed even if endoscopy is normal? So an endoscopy is, you know, you can do an endoscopy, you can get a false negative or a false positive on an endoscopy. Remember, your, your small intestine is 22 foot long, right? So if we look at the small intestine, and so generally, if this is the stomach, and this is the small intestine down here, right? Um, what, what happens, the doctor will run that scope in and they'll take little samples. And most biopsies, they take about four samples. To, to technically to diagnose villus atrophy and to really get good accurate data, you need six to eight samples. Most doctors, most GI doctors take only about four. Um, and so imagine this is 22 foot long and it has the surface area of the size of a tennis court. So it's vast. Your small intestine is vast in size considering that it's wrapped all up inside of you, right? Folded up so beautifully. But you can take biopsy samples and there may not be damage where that doctor took the sample. And so there could be damage here. Maybe the damage is here, maybe the damage is here. And they just didn't take the samples from those areas. It doesn't mean you don't have damage. It just means the areas where they took the sample didn't have damage. So you've got to understand there are limitations to doing a, a biopsy. And this is why it's important if you're going to rely on a biopsy for data that you really talk to the, to the GI doctor you're working with and make sure they're taking enough biopsy samples to give you more accuracy as opposed to less. Um, let's see here. So... Somebody says, I just received six pack of certified gluten-free risotto rice. I order, also ordered gluten-free fried rice. So I'm glad you put that, that scary face there and hopefully this information helps you to send those products back um, so that you don't you know, damage yourself. Um, is it true that, no, uh, let's see, let's move to, that's not a... So Robert says, oh no, I had Chinese steamed rice earlier. I feel guilty. Good. Feel very guilty, Robert. And change it. Change the diet. What's your thought on organic cauliflower rice as a substitute for basmatic rice? I think it's a great substitute. Um, absolutely. Just take a food processor, get you some whole cauliflower, cut it up, grind it in that food processor. You'll have a nice powdery rice substitute that you can use.
Let's see. Does white rice have less gluten than brown rice? No, it's not white or brown. It's not about how much or less gluten is there. They both have pretty much similar amounts of gluten. So you're being hammered either way. As far as heavy metals though, as I mentioned earlier, brown rice tends to have more of the toxic heavy metals than white rice. A healthy replacement for rice. I think somebody just mentioned cauliflower rice, vegetables, healthy replacement, vegetables, other food, right? We all get stuck on this in our mind. This is just really a, a leap in the mind that most people need to make. Um, going from, from a high carbohydrate diet, which is basically what many people who are on this traditional gluten-free diet, they're just substituting one grain for another. And so there's carbohydrate, they're still loading on carbohydrates and that high level of carbohydrate is still contributory to the imbalance and, and part of their problem. So think of substitutes not as like a direct substitute. If you really want to substitute, just eat something different. And don't, don't tell yourself you're losing um, yourself because you're losing food. A lot of people think they're depriving themselves of something. And I would say what you're really doing if you continue to eat poorly is you're depriving yourself of health, right? You're not depriving yourself of food. You're depriving yourself of health. Switch the narrative in your mind because then it's very easy to make the diet change and not feel like you're, you're struggling or depriving yourself. But if you want to be healthy, it, it requires a, a greater degree of, of uh, consistency in the right diet. And again, eating the rice is not going to get you there. I like this. Uh, this Mandy chimed in. Rice flour gives me brain fog and irritability. And then, and then offers up a suggestion on, on something else, which is cassava flour. She says cassava flour works well for, for French crepes. Um, yeah, because you've got cassava, arrowroot, tapioca are all options. You've got to be careful with those other flour options. And one of the reasons why is they can be um, high glycemic. And so if you overdo them, you know, you can still, you can still hurt yourself, you know, if you're, if you're eating heavy glycemic load. Let's see. Yeah, so somebody's chiming in. Juice Plus has rice in it. Should one stop taking? Yeah, I mean, here's one of the problems. One of the problems we actually have products online that you can trust is because the supplement industry, they love taking this right here. Rice flour, rice starch. And they love, because it's super cheap. To get a hold of and they put it as a filler in their supplements and I even see this a lot of brands that are they're claiming to be gluten-free brands but they haven't read the research and, and companies that are catering to people with gluten-free needs that haven't read or updated themselves on the research in my opinion you know they need to get it right if they're going to cater to an audience they need to understand what the need of that audience is and so this is one of those areas where you have to you have to really be careful and read the labels on your supplements because rice is a super common filler, corn is a super common, a common filler, and they still label those products gluten-free even though technically they shouldn't. I, didn't, I, I meant to put the study up for you tonight. There's a brand new study that just came out on corn last month. It's not the first study on corn. It's just one in a line of multiple studies on corn gluten showing that people with gluten sensitivity, most of them, react to corn just as aggressively as they react to wheat in terms of inflammatory response. So you, you want to know that many of you may be, you know, if I, maybe I just took away two things from you tonight, corn and rice, but, um, hopefully if you've read my book, no grain, no pain, or you follow me for any length of time, hopefully this isn't brand new information for you, but if it is dive in and get it done. What about cultures eating rice for a long time? What about it? I get that's another question I get a lot and my answer is I don't really care that cultures have been eating rice for a long time cultures have also been dealing with disease for a long time so you know we have to look at just because a food might be a common thing in a culture I mean I'm my culture is German and Irish and what have we been doing for years and years and years right beer which is full of gluten and not good for you 
Um, the alcohol is not good for you, and it, and it can make you sick. But it's part of culture. It is. There's no, no doubt about it, right? And then what else do we do um, in, the, in the Irish culture? Lots of whiskey and, and, uh, and uh, spirits derived from grain, which is also not good for you and also problematic. So just because something is, is famous or popularized in a culture doesn't make it healthy. And we have to, we have to, for, we have to forget that, especially if you're gluten sensitive, it doesn't matter what the culture is. If you're gluten sensitive, you have to address your diet needs so that you can re recapture your health and maintain it. Are regular potatoes okay? Yes, they are, regular potatoes are gluten-free. They're grain-free. Now, you can overdo any starchy carb, and that, you know, this is where you got to be careful. Is a lot of people, you know, when they go for the potatoes, they don't go for a small serving, a reasonable serving of potatoes. They get like that massive GMO baked potato, and then they pack it full of, you know, full of fake bacon bits and fake cheese and fake butter, uh, and, and, you know, they pay a price. So, you know, it's not so much potatoes that are a problem so much as it is the quantity and what you put in it, what you add to it. So you just have to be cautious about those things. Okay, what are the worst foods when trying to get rid of candida and what are the best foods? Uh, worst foods, for if you're trying to get rid of candida, are heavy carbs, high carb foods. High carbs, simple, we'll say high simple, or easy access carbs. And this includes a lot of your fruit, like grapes, bananas, and the like. These things are yeast food, right? What will yeast do with carbohydrates? Yeast will ferment carbs. And what happens when yeast ferments carbs? You get wine right there in your gut. Your gut becomes a wine factory. Um, so then the yeast gets stronger, they grow. And when yeast grow, they don't just produce wine, they also produce something called a, a hyphal wall protein. And a hyphal wall protein looks like gluten to your body. So this is one of the reasons why people also go on gluten-free, continue to struggle. Even though they are gluten-free, it's because they have a yeast overgrowth because they're over-carbing. And that yeast overgrowth is driving up the production of these proteins that yeast produce that mimic gluten and create a persistent gluten-like reaction. Um, best foods to eat if you're trying to get rid of candida, you know, vegetables, meats, nuts, all okay. Is there a test to see if you're sensitive to rice? There's a test to see if you're gluten sensitive. Um, genetic testing, we can put a link up there for you. But if you're trying to know whether or not you need to be gluten free, my opinion, genetic testing is what you want. This is the best way to know. And the reason why, as I mentioned earlier, the biopsy can be, you can get a false negative. The blood work that oftentimes measures for different antibody responses to, to wheat or barley or rye or other things, those can also be misleading. So a lot of times you get false negative on those types of tests as well. So genetic testing, if you have positive genotype for gluten sensitivity, you avoid gluten. That's, and that includes rice gluten, that includes wheat gluten, that includes corn gluten, it includes all the grains if you want to really recover. Uh, what about tofu or soy? Tofu and soy are, well, soy is a legume, so it's not a grain. And uh, tofu is the fermented byproduct of, of soy. And so I would say where you have to be careful there with soy is many people don't do well with soy because it's very challenging to digest. Uh, and so if you're gluten sensitive and you've been eating gluten and your gut's damaged, right, and you're trying to recover, if you just start putting a bunch of soy substitutes in, your gut's already damaged, it's going to struggle trying to process and break that soy down. So this is where soy can become very problematic. Tofu, um, to tofu is almost like pre-digested soy. It's a fermented soy. And the pro again, the, pro the other problem with soy is GMO. Most soy grown in the U.S. specifically today, um, more than 90% of it is genetically modified. And you know, you know I, I don't recommend you go anywhere near genetically modified foods. Um, there's no, nowhere near enough safety data on them. They're playing, you know, the food manufacturers, they're, they're patenting food, you know, they're patenting what God created in an attempt to, to, to take money out of your pocket and put money in their pocket without 
the ethics and morals that goes behind the safety data testing. And that, that, so the data on, on safety has not been adequately studied for any of these GMO foods. And so you're really, you're playing a gamble when you eat them. So it's a great question. If I go gluten-free but my family doesn't and I cook for them, will I get exposed to make a difference in my symptoms? You may, you may, just depending on what you're cooking for them. I mean, if you're, if you're you know, baking a, let's just say you're baking a loaf of bread and you've got the flour and it's aerosolized in the air and you're breathing it in, yeah, you could potentially be reacting. Um, so, you know, I would be real cautious about that. There, there are, you know, with, with celiac disease in particular, there are a lot of families where they set up a, a, what's called a clean area in the kitchen for the individual who is gluten sensitive, which is crazy because in most families, remember what did I just say, it's genetic, right? So gluten sensitivity is not a disease, it's genetic. So usually what happens is you get one person who has unfortunately been diagnosed with celiac disease and that person, the rest of the family is like, well, because you have celiac disease, we're going to take you gluten-free, but we're going to keep eating gluten around you. And this is one of the worst things you can do to somebody, right? Because now they feel socially isolated in their own home with their own family, you know, and, and because gluten sensitivity is genetic, the odds are that everybody else in that family, brothers, sisters, uh, et cetera, are probably genetically are probably gluten sensitive anyway. They just haven't developed celiac disease. Remember, there's over a hundred forms of medical conditions that gluten can cause. Some people develop arthritis. Some people develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Some people develop brain fog as an early symptom of gluten exposure. And so just because you don't have celiac disease doesn't mean that you should be eating gluten either. Again, that's if you've got a family member, and there've been studies on this where first degree relatives of people with celiac disease most commonly have gluten induced disease even if it's not celiac disease, it's what we would call extra intestinal manifestation of gluten exposure, where the damage to that individual is occurring outside of the intestine, so it's not manifesting as celiac disease. Um, somebody's talking about wild rice. Wild rice is okay. Wild rice is a, is a marsh grass and technically not a grain, so you can eat wild rice and that would be okay. So somebody's asking, what if a, a food allergy test said I don't react to rice with IgA or IgG? So IgA and IgG. Okay, so you're not reacting in that way. Well, did they pre-qualify the test? Let's just say, because with gluten sensitivity, one of the very common problems is individuals with gluten, and they don't know it, they have IgA deficiency. So. If you have IgA deficiency and you use IgA as a tool to measure whether or not you have an antibody to something, because by default, because you have a deficiency of IgA, you get, a lot of times you get a false negative. So not all labs do this, but you have to pre-qualify the test. And what I mean by that is the person who's being tested, the IgA levels need to be checked not IgA to specific foods, but just the total IgA. Same thing with the total IgG. You've got to pre-qualify that these individuals are not antibody deficient before you do tests that rely on antibodies to measure whether or not they have a reaction. And so there's IgA, there's IgG, there's IgM, there's IgE, there's something called an immune complex, which most labs don't measure, don't even, most labs don't talk about it. And there's something called a T cell response. And so that test you're talking about does not measure these things. You don't measure this, you don't measure that, you don't measure that, you don't measure that, you don't pre-qualify the antibodies here or here. And so what you really have is you have information that's misleading. And so no, I would not rely on a test like that to make the decision as to whether or not you should or shouldn't eat rice. Again, genetic testing. This is why, because you can't trick a genetic test. You either have the genes or you don't. If you have the genes, what that means is that when you expose your body to gluten, whether it's rice, corn, wheat, barley, etc., doesn't matter, you are going to have an immunological response and that is ingrained into your DNA. Your body's gonna perceive that grain protein to be an enemy of the state and it's gonna mount an immune response against it. And these are just the immune responses that we know about. There are many more that I'm certain we have not yet discovered um, because every year the science evolves and every year the science gets, gets better. 
right? And so you, you don't want to rely on an antiquated type of technology to determine whether you're going to eat something or not. So Josh asks, I can understand low quality brown rice and rice products. How about high quality white rice or possibly after some healing is done? I, I don't recommend it, Josh, and I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you mean by low quality versus high quality. If you want to elaborate on, on what you're defining the difference between a low and a high quality, because in my opinion, rice is a low quality food no matter how you look at it, whether it's organic or whether it's not. Because even organic rice contains toxic metal. Um, and again, especially in higher quantities, it, it, it's a problem. Let's go down on the left side. Uh, somebody's asking about optimizing nutrition. A celiac, I'm celiac, I have low iron. How do I optimize my nutrition? The first thing you have to do is stop the damage. And this is again, where a lot of people do the diet wrong is they per consistently, persistently continue to eat the rice, the corn, the other grains that are labeled gluten-free. And so they continue to struggle with damage. They continue to have inflammatory damage. The GI tract continues to take on damage and they continue to struggle with malabsorption. And so their iron levels don't come up. Iron's a very common deficiency in people with gluten sensitivity. Actually, it's one of the most common but I was talking about this earlier, malnutrition, right? Malnutrition, why? GI inflammation, so damage of the gut, but also generalized inflammation. When your body is generally inflamed, you need more nutrients to repair the inflammatory damage. And so what happens is the inflammation drives up the need for more nutrients. And so you lose gas mileage on nutrition, right? And if you're already eating poor quality foods with low nutrition density, it's very, very hard to overcome. It's very, very hard to overcome malnutrition if you don't change your diet appropriately. So Linda says, I have a young friend, 32, whose intestines are so damaged that they're planning to insert a pacemaker-like device to stimulate movement. I think he has celiac, but when I asked him about it, he said he tested negative. This was 15 years ago. Any suggestions? You find new doctors. I mean, a pacemaker to stimulate movement in the bowel, you've got to figure out why the intestines are damaged. I mean, that makes zero sense. Let's put a machine in use because we, we don't know why you're broken. Somebody has got to be more investigative in that in that arena. Otherwise, that that young man is in for a hell of a life, uh, a tortuous life. Should you repeat an IgG test, and if so, how often? Um, well, I don't recommend using just specifically IgG antibody tests to measure to see whether or not. Uh, you're allergic to foods. I think IgG tests are one of the most l misleading types of tests as it relates to food reactivity. So um, not the type of technology I would even recommend doing once, much less repeating it. Um, there are other technologies that are far more advanced. Thoughts on coconut water, kefir, and cabbage? I think cabbage is great. Coconut water, kefir, you, you know, if you're making it at home possibly, but you've got to look at a lot of those kefirs and look at what they're fermenting them with and be very careful about that. Coconut water has a lot of sugar. A lot of people don't realize that. I had, a, I had one time I had a young patient, you know, she was drinking, you know, this, and this was a lot, but she was drinking like six to eight of these coconut waters a day. And it was literally, it was rotting her teeth out. She, you know, her, she went back to her dentist, her she was trying to be gluten free and that's what she was using to nourish herself. And she gave herself so many calories. There's a lot of sugar in coconut water. So again, depending on how long you ferment the coconut water so that the, um, so that the microorganisms have enough time to eat and consume all of the sugar, otherwise you, you can get into trouble with it. Since, so Devora says, since when did rice have gluten? Forever, it's, it's always had a form of gluten. Um, that's not new news, it's just that Again, when, when doctors are talking about rice versus wheat, barley, and rye and celiac disease, they're all focused on one kind of gluten. Predominantly, the type of gluten is called gliadin. And it's, it's a, unfortunately, it's an inaccurate and underrepresented viewpoint. And this is, again, why so many people 
persistently stay sick even though they've gone on a, on a traditional gluten-free gluten -free diet. Yeah, this is a good one. So Paul says, so those gluten-free storage food packs are probably garbage I can't eat. Yes, good point. A lot of the, like the emergency food rations, the powdered foods that you can buy online, most of those are, the gluten-free options are mostly full of a bunch of rice and corn. Yeah, it's garbage. You don't want to eat it. My, my advice is, you know, if you're trying to get emergency food and plan ahead for the potential of an emergency, you know, there's a lot better ways to do it than buying that, that processed powdered stuff. That's, I would never want to be in a situation where I had to eat that. I would just, the brain fog and the, and the, um, and the dysfunction and the inflammation would make you so unprepared to deal with any kind of emergency. Um, just not a good idea. Let's see, go down on that left side. So, Anna, this is a great question. How did people thousands of years ago, like Old Testament, eat bread as one of their main food sources and be okay? You're making a huge assumption that they ate bread as one of their main food sources. Um, but even, even, let's just assume that that is true, um, which nobody knows, um, because, you know, you go back, you know, pre-Jesus, right? Old Testament, pre-Jesus, you're still going back to a lot of, a lot of uh, cultures were not predominantly grain-based in their diets. They, they had agrarian farming, but many of them were still eating heavy meats and vegetables. Uh, and there's, there's archaeological evidence that proves that. But there's also archaeological evidence that proves that the oldest known uh, cause, or not cause, but case of celiac disease is 2000 BC. So we know this was going on then as well. I think, I think one, of the, one of the romantic notions that, that we have in society, and, and, and many cultures have this romantic notion that somehow the past was better, the food was healthier, People were more robust. I don't know that we could really make those claims. I, I think those are notions that we cling to, but I don't think anybody could prove that to be true or false either way. And I don't, I don't think we um, have any evidence that states that. But I know we've got evidence that states that celiac disease existed then. So we know this problem has been around a really long time. I think where a lot of people struggle today, and, and it's become more heightened and more aware, is because many people... Today, their primary staple food is grain, right? 50% of calories consumed in the U.S. alone come from wheat. And that's been studied. And that doesn't include the calories from corn or rice. And so if you look at the average, at least American, and probably this is true of the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, um, the industrialized world, you look at the average and the quantity of calories that are consumed that are grain-based, most cultures in these, in these modern regions are anywhere from 65 to 70 plus percent of their diets coming largely from grain. That wasn't true. That wasn't true 30 years ago. It wasn't true 50 years ago. This is a, a trend as we've, as, as it, in industrialized countries have subsidized through taxpayer dollars, have subsidized the, the growth of grain as a mass food to feed the masses. And so we have more of it. We have people eating more of it. We see people reacting more to it because it is a dose over time quantity issue as well. I uh, noticed some medications, ingredients include some corn. Yeah, very much so. Um, probably one of the most common meds that have corn in it. And I see this be a huge holdup for, for people that have Hashimoto's. Hypothyroidism is the levothyroxine has corn. And so it's the very thing that can, that can trigger Hashimoto's, which is grain, is in the very medication that they're being prescribed to treat the disease. And this is why a lot of those people uh, won't recover or won't ever, won't ever get beyond it. Let's see here. Let's go down on the, le on the right, I'm sorry. And then, there we go. Um, thoughts, I think I answered that. Thoughts on wild rice, you can eat it, but I don't, 
I'm not a fan of it personally. It's just because I don't care for the way it tastes. But you can eat it. It is gluten-free. Uh, what do I think of the keto diet? I think the keto diet is... How do I want to put this? It's, it's an antidote for the carbohydrate toxic diet, but it is not a solution long term for everyone. There's certain people that do well on keto. If you've got a massive tumor and you're trying to treat your cancer, keto's good. If you've got epileptic seizure disorder, keto can be pretty good. But ultimately, keto is not a long term solution for most people. It's, a, it's an antidote to toxic high carbohydrate diets. So a lot of people go keto and feel really well because they've cut back on their carbohydrates and so they're no longer flooding their, their, their body and elevating their blood sugar and making their blood like syrup and you know just loaded with glucose. So, so going keto to a large extent solves that problem short term, but long term, your body needs to be able to go either direction. You should be able to get into ketosis. You should also be able to extrapolate energy from carbohydrate and you should have good balance between carbs, fats, and proteins in your diet as opposed to being overbalanced on fat and underbalanced on carbohydrate. What about rice protein and protein powders? Yeah, same thing, Cheryl, um, no good. Don't, don't recommend it. Um, I've heard, let's see. Yeah, I like that commentary. Mark says, I've heard that sumo wrestlers eat a big bowl of rice six times a day to gain weight, but many of these great athletes die before the age of 50. Yep, that's true. Um, so again, you know, you can use a toxic food to achieve a goal. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the end outcome is going to be happy. Let's see. Let's see. So Lena says, okay, so looking at No Grain, No Pain, the book, and I know based on my questionable celiac history and mold exposures, I need to get on the bandwagon, but it's overwhelming. Should we work with a medical team to run uh, starting nutritional testing, et cetera, before jumping in? You don't have to, Lena. Just If you really want to just jump in, fall No Grain, No Pain. Phase one, 15 days, get on to phase two, and just stay on phase two. There's no danger in it. You're not gonna become malnourished if you're in phase two of the no grain, no pain diet indefinitely. It's a balanced diet. Um, and if you feel better and you're noticing leaps and bounds in your health, you'll have an answer directly. Now, if you don't and you still find yourself struggling, that's when you work with a doctor. That's when you get on board and you get somebody to help you run the right tests, look at your nutrition in the right way. But it's free right, to, to, to follow along, no grain, no pain. It doesn't, co I mean, maybe cost you a copy of the book, but really technically, you could technically go check it out at the library. So in that regard, it wouldn't cost you anything. But yeah, that's where I would start. Let's go down more on the, on the left side. Can mold mimic gluten sensitivity? What if somebody is strictly grain-free, only eating organic for six months, but symptoms are still present? You may have a mold issue. Mold is, is a very, very common, we'll just say, inhibitor of good progress, right? And a lot of people have mold and, and gluten. Remember I said earlier, I was talking about yeast, and I said that yeast can produce proteins that mimic gluten. Well, yeast is a type of mold. Now, there are other types of mold. Yeast is a type of mold that lives in our GI tracts. It could live in our body. Um, but you can also have environmental molds that you're being exposed to. And the symptoms of mold toxicity can mimic, in a very big way, the symptoms of gluten sensitivity. And many people have both. They're both gluten sensitive, but they're also in toxic mold. Um, I've been in toxic mold. It's no fun. It's no fun at all. You get super sick and you don't know why. So if your diet is super clean, you know, the next step, in my opinion, if you're still struggling, is get with a good functional practitioner and get testing done. Don't guess. Test, don't guess. I mean, if you read No Grain, No Pain, I wrote an entire chapter on testing, not guessing, because so many people, you know, they treat their health, you know, in such a way where they're, where they're guessing at it. And again, I get it. You, you're doing your best. You're trying you're trying to take your best guess, but when you get to a point where it isn't working, 
don't let a year or two or three or five go by where that damage just accumulates. Because if you do, it's a lot harder to make a comeback, even with the right accuracy. And so you want to get on top of it as quickly as possible. So Barbara says, if, if my blood celiac panel came back with abnormal IgA and IgE in the IgG portion, and I also have tested to have an allergy to wheat and corn, what steps would you take next to obtain an official celiac diagnosis? Why? Why do you, um, why do you need an official celiac diagnosis? Let's think about that just for a minute. It's a, this is a good question. Is there benefit to knowing that you have celiac? What's the difference between gluten sensitivity and celiac disease? Very simply put, everyone with celiac disease is gluten sensitive, but not everybody with gluten sensitivity will develop celiac disease. And I see people get stuck in this trap where they want a diagnosis. They want that celiac diagnosis to convince them to change their diet. And I'm not saying that's you, Barbara, but what I am saying is, is psychologically, you don't need the diagnosis. You just need to know whether or not you're gluten sensitive. And if you have that information, it doesn't matter whether you're celiac. Because what are you going to do differently? If you're celiac or if you have what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, right, what's the difference? The difference is the manifestation of how gluten you know, creates inflammation in your body. For some people, the inflammation happens in the small intestine and that just so happens to be diagnosed as celiac disease for many. But for many others, and as a matter of fact, far more people have non-celiac gluten sensitivity than have celiac disease. So seeking out the celiac diagnosis doesn't benefit you because there's no benefit to saying, hey, I'm celiac versus, hey, I'm non-celiac gluten sensitive. Um, and so, I, again, I, I, maybe you could clarify for me, but I just don't think there's a benefit for you other than you expose yourself to another medical procedure. You know, think about what an, an upper GI is. What is an upper GI? They take a fiber optic camera that has been up thousands of other people, okay? And it sounds gross, but this is the reality, right? The, the equipment is reused. And they, and they clean the equipment, but the equipment is reused. But what if the people that had that equipment in them before you did were really sick and had really nasty bugs, and the guy who's supposed to clean that equipment just didn't do a good job the day you went in to have your test done? It's a risk. That's why when you go under, when you go into a GI office and they say, yeah, we're going to do an endoscopy, that's why they give you this thick page of forms that say sign this or we won't do it because they're basically saying you agree that these are all the risks, right? They're giving you the spelling out all the risks of that procedure. And one of those risks is infecting you, right? Infecting you with somebody else's bacteria and where the nastiest bugs in the world live is in hospitals. So, you know, if, 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 it, if you know you're gluten sensitive and you're already following a gluten-free diet, and, you, and you're saying, okay, well, I, I need to get the celiac diagnosis. You have to ask yourself, what is the risk of knowing that by doing that procedure versus the benefit of knowing that? And if the answer is it's really not a benefit, then make a decision that you're most comfortable with. But you know, again, in my opinion, there, there's no benefit to knowing you have celiac versus you don't unless you're trying to track an already pre-existing known case of villus atrophy just to see whether or not you have you know, you've had villus atrophy recovery, but even then, remember, biopsies are not 100% accurate, so you can get false positives and or false negatives on them. Rachel's asking about ideas on emerging food storage. Rachel, go back and watch our show on preparation. Um, I did an entire show on food prep, and there's a lot of ideas in that for you. So basically, uh, June says, what, what carbs are good for celiac patients to eat? Root vegetables. Um, there's lots of those, right? Beets, tapioca, cassava, potato. You can eat those things. They're fine to eat. Um, you just, again, it, it, depending on who you are and whether or not you're allergic to other things, but those, I mean, there's plenty to eat. I mean, a lot of people... You get overwhelmed, and I understand why. It's a total change from what you're typically used to doing, but don't get overwhelmed. Just baby step it. You may not be perfect today, but move in a, move in a righter direction every day 
Um, if you, if you, a lot of people, they get so overwhelmed that they choose to never start. And so when, they, when you don't start your journey, you're guaranteed the same outcome that you have today, which is illness. But when you take baby steps in the right direction, maybe it won't be perfect, but each day you do a little bit better. Each day it gets a little bit easier. Each day you feel a little bit more energetic where you're more capable of making better decisions and more capable of cooking your and prepping your own food. You know, it's a process for some people. Don't get overwhelmed by it. So, so Huda asks, I, I know you recommend a third, a third, a third carbs, fats, proteins every day. What maximum net carbs do you recommend? It's not a maximum because I, I recommend a third, a third, a third as a general place to start. But that doesn't mean that that third is perfect for everyone. And, you know, let me give you an example. You take somebody who exercises aggressively, they may need more carbohydrate depending on what kind of exercise they're doing, or they may need more protein for that recovery. So it, it, a lot of that, we start with the, what's called the rule of thirds because it's balance. But depending on what a person's doing in their life, we may make manipulations or modifications to that rule. Are mushrooms not a good idea to eat because of the fungi? No, mushrooms are fine. Um, Mushrooms have a lot of medicinal benefits, especially the right ones. Would I speak to organic rice concentrate? I think it's just a, a way of saying we took rice that was organically grown and we created a slurry with it and we put it in these vitamins as a cheap filler. Um, that's basically what that means. So if you're, you know, again, if you're celiac or gluten sensitive and you've got rice in your supplement, put it down. It's not worth it. Um, let's see, my food sensitivities have been getting uh, worse. I can't seem to eat without causing severe asthma attack, angry elephant on my chest, tightness. I have seen an allergist and I'm trying to avoid the foods he said I'm allergic to, but I continue to have these attacks after eating. I was hoping for answers um, truly by seeing the GI specialist. Well, go see a GI specialist, but you know, what'll probably happen is they'll scope you, tell you that you have inflammation somewhere, but they won't give you any solution uh, or any reason as to why you're having aggressive reactions every time you eat. I mean, the problem in the, in the, in the field, in my opinion, the problem in, in gastroenterology is you get, they tell you what is wrong without telling you why it's wrong. Right, which is basically useless information in my opinion, because if they tell you, oh, your gut's inflamed. Okay, great, why is it inflamed? What's causing the inflammation? We don't know, but take this antacid, right? And do it for the rest of your life and don't ask me any more questions because that's a limitation of what I can give you. Uh, that's a very common scenario in a GI doctor's office. Now I'm not saying all GI doctors are like that, and maybe yours is not, but um, if they're not running advanced specialized tests beyond the scope, you're probably not gonna find the reason. You're probably just gonna find uh, what, what it looks like, but you're not gonna necessarily find why it looks that way. Let's see here. Okay, is quinoa safe? JC wants to know. No, quinoa, there's actually been a few studies on quinoa. Quinoa mimics gluten to such a great degree that many people with gluten issues still react to quinoa as well. Even though it's technically not a grain, it's a pseudo grain. Um, JC, I would recommend that you go on glutenfreesociety.org. We've got some really robust articles about quinoa and, and some of the problems with it, and that might help you as well. Are there any noodles I can eat that are truly gluten free? Um, I've seen noodles made from almond, I've seen noodles made from kelp. Um, noodles made from mung bean. So, I mean, there definitely are options that are out there. Again, this is part of the learning curve where, where at first it seems overwhelming, but the more of these things that you learn, the easier it can become. Lynn's asking, what happened to your food sensitivity test, Dr. O? It's still coming, Lynn. Um, devil's in the details. We're trying to work those final bits out. So be patient with me. Um, what medicine should I take if levothyroxine isn't good for my thyroid? That's between you and your doctor, Shelly. Um, you know, the question though that you want to ask your doctor is, you know, hey, I'm gluten sensitive. Can you, one of the things you can ask is for a compounded version of levothyroxine. 
meaning that, that the doctor writes the prescription into a compounding pharmacy where they can take the same drug that you need and they can make it without the corn-based fillers. And that's, you know, that's going to get you a closer step in the right direction. That's a good place to start, though. So Juan says, people didn't have an issue with wheat before wheat was GMO, and that's just wrong. That's a misconception, Juan. Um, there was no GMO in 1943 when celiac disease, the actual cause of celiac disease, was found to largely be responsibly uh, contributed to by wheat. You know, that was 1943 before any GMO existed. So you're wrong. Like, I, I, I can respect that you have an opinion, but, you know, you're wrong. GMO is not the cause of what we're seeing. Now, it's certainly not helping things, and it certainly may be an exacerbatory factor, but it is not the cause. Um, does Synthroid have gluten? I, it does. It has corn in it, corn gluten. Um, so again, going back to what I just answered a minute ago, which is you can get it, you can get it compounded. Talk with your prescribing doctor about that possibility. Is it true that celiac disease people can drink or handle A2 milk? Mm, yes and no. Not all can. Um, A2 milk's a better a step in a better direction, but you know. Many celiacs still have milk allergy. That's a super common thing, even with A2 milk. Can eating gluten while pregnant affect the baby throughout life? Yes. Um, yes, if you're, yeah, if you're eating gluten, and you know, remember, gluten can, not only can it, it can pass through, right? It also passes through in the breast milk. And so we see, I've, I've seen cases where children were, were being hurt um, because mom was eating gluten and baby was gluten sensitive. So I, again, I'm, I'm not telling you not to breastfeed if you're breastfeeding. I think breastfeeding is the best thing you can do for your child. But if your child's got a gluten issue and you're eating gluten, it's better to cut that gluten out when you're, when you're breastfeeding that baby. Yeah, I like that comment. So Dolly came back and said, so with my first two pregnancies, I was eating gluten and the babies were very underweight and my third son was gluten free and he was born normal weight. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, it's very common to see babies, infants being born under the undue influence of gluten, having um, low birth weight, lower IQs, lower circumference in their head size and their brain size. Okay. What about nutritional yeast as a cause for GI issues or bloating or otherwise harmful effects? Yes, I don't, I'm not a fan of nutritional yeast, not a fan of them at all. Um, question about sodium starch glycolate as a filler in armor thyroid. Yes, it can be derived from wheat or corn. So if you're, that's another drug, armor thyroid is another one that, um, that can definitely be problematic for some people with gluten issues. So. Again, the solution, talk with your prescribing doctor about a potential compounding. Okay, 7.15, that means it's time to go eat dinner. Hey, thanks for spending your Monday evening with me. I appreciate it. I appreciate your, um, you know, you're taking time out of your busy schedule to be here and learn. Um, help me help others, right? Our mission here is to save 100 million lives. And by, you know, by that, we need you to share this information with people you think could benefit from it. So don't be shy with the share button, um, copy or paste the URL and send it to your loved ones who you think might benefit from this information. Also, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Sign up for our newsletter there, it's free. If you want unfettered, uncensored information coming your way, um, that's the best place to make sure that you don't get censored from this information if it's something you wanna get. So again, thanks for spending your Monday with me. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great evening. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe and once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with 
other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.